and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. It is such a pleasure to see you at this wonderful institution. The National Constitution Center, as those of you who have been here before know, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And as part of our inspiring mission, we are a beautiful museum of We the People, a center for civic education, and America's town hall, the one place in the country where citizens can come to hear the best arguments on all sides of the constitutional debates that are riveting the country and make up your own minds. We've had a spectacular series of programs recently. Last week, Alan Dershowitz debated Noah Feldman from Harvard Law School on whether the president has the constitutional authority to target and kill American citizens abroad. Uh, on March 27th, Professor Dershowitz will return to talk about the constitutional issues at the heart of his new book. And today we are gathered to discuss one of the most important and complicated and uh, necessary to debate questions confronting the country today, and that is the reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, as we will hear, is responsible for authorizing uh, secret warrants to collect uh, data uh, outside of the ordinary criminal justice process in the service of national security, and we will discuss the arguments for and against reforming it. Um, to do so, we're proud to partner with the Constitution Project. Based in Washington, D.C., the Constitution Project is a great organization that, like the National Constitution Center, brings together experts from all sides of the political spectrum to make recommendations about constitutional and legal reform. Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce the senior counsel for the Constitution Project, Catherine Stern, who will make some introductory words of remark and then introduce our honored guest speaker, Senator Richard Blumenthal. Catherine Stern. Thank you, Jeff, um, for that generous welcome. And many thanks, too, to the staff of the National Constitution Center for working so hard to help us put on this event at the Museum of We the People. We're going to try to do something very difficult here today, something maybe even impossible, which is not to balance uh, national security and civil liberties. I'm talking about being both entertaining and accurate about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. We're going to be try, trying to be frank and open and at the same time deal with the, with the tough questions. Helping Americans understand what is at stake when our Constitution is at risk is the core mission of the Constitution Project. Our organization brings together policy experts, government officials, and legal practitioners from across the political spectrum to foster consensus-based solutions to some of the most difficult constitutional challenges of our time. And one of the most puzzling of those challenges is how to continue our tradition of individual privacy in the digital age, at a time when the government's capacity, as well as private industry's capacity for surveillance of our citizens is massively increasing. And the technologies for collecting information are far outpacing the laws that protect us. Jeff Rosen has taken up many fascinating aspects of this problem in his books and essays, so we're thrilled to be here with him and with representatives from all three branches of government and from our wonderful community of advocates for government transparency and oversight to shed some light on the institution that is at the center of the NSA surveillance controversy. I want to thank our distinguished panelists for bringing their expertise and delightfully diverse points of view to this debate. But before we hear from them, it's my honor to introduce United States Senator from Connecticut, Richard Blumenthal. Senator Blumenthal has a long record of serving our country and the state of Connecticut as a U.S. Attorney for Connecticut, as a state representative and state senator, and as a five-term Attorney General. And it's my understanding that the very day after the world learned about the NSA's secret program to collect and analyze all Americans' phone call records, Senator Blumenthal began working on the legislation we'll hear about today, a comprehensive effort with broad bipartisan support to bring more public knowledge and civil rights representation to the workings of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. The FISA Court representations, I'm sorry, the FISA Court has been approving the NSA's surveillance programs behind closed doors in hearings where only the executive branch's interests are represented. 
Senator Blumenthal has proposed empowering a special advocate with the power and responsibility to ensure that the public's privacy rights are enforced. So we're delighted he could join us today to tell us more about this important effort. It's my great pleasure to introduce Senator Richard Blumenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine and Jeff, and thank you for having me here today when Jeff was introducing the Constitution Project and its bipartisan mission. I was reminded of the story of Al Smith, the one-time governor of the state of New York. Some of you of a certain age may still remember him, as I do. And the story is told that he went to Sing Sing, the penitentiary in New York, to give a speech one evening, and he was accustomed to beginning his speeches by saying, my fellow Democrats. <laughs> but he wasn't sure that every inmate at the penitentiary was a Democrat, so he had a fallback line, which was to say, my friends. But again, he wasn't really sure that every prisoner was a friend, so he had one last line, which was to say, I'm glad to see so many of you here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to see so many of you here, Republican or Democrat or Independent. This issue really is one that should bring us together or divide us without regard to party or partisan differences. And I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to be with you today and to talk a little bit about this very difficult issue, difficult to be both entertaining and accurate, but by comparison to what the gentleman did down the street here, uh, relatively manageable, even if challenging. Uh, you may recall that about a week ago, one of my colleagues, Senator Dianne Feinstein, spoke on the Senate floor to lay out a series of very alarming allegations that put the country literally on the cusp of a constitutional crisis. In a very cogent and powerful speech, Senator Feinstein described her belief that the CIA has circumvented the Senate Intelligence Committee's oversight efforts in a number of ways by stonewalling the committee's attempts to obtain certain documents, searching com committee computers to monitor staff activity, surreptitiously seizing material, and most disturbingly, accusing the committee staff of criminal misconduct in an effort to intimidate them. Now, we're very early in the investigation. There may be actually several investigations underway, at least one by the Department of Justice, and I am reaching no conclusions here as to what the merits are of her allegations, but certainly when such allegations are made by someone of Senator Feinstein's stature, especially someone who has been so supportive of the Intelligence Committee, they have to be regarded as credible and significant. And they allege facts and potential violations of law that have to be addressed. Certainly, the looming issue concerns not only the violations of law that may be involved there, but also how the rule of law is really imposed on the intelligence community, which operates in secret and sometimes has shown that it seeks to operate above the law. Looming ahead is the broader question of whether the intelligence community, which has been afforded so much deference over the past decade, can operate within the apparatus of accountability that apportions power between the branches of government, as the founders sought to do, and more generally, we have to ask how much unchecked and unmonitored intelligence activity can be consistent with the rule of law. And those questions, very simply, cannot be long delayed, in part because of their urgency to maintain our constitutional values, and in part because a lot of the key statutes expire on June 1, 2015. So when you're asked, will there be legislation? Yes, there almost certainly will be legislation or a serious attempt and a bipartisan attempt to reach legislation because the statutes 
some of the key statutes expire on June 1, 2015. The, the rule of law, as we know, particularly here, has been the bedrock principle of American democracy, the lodestar of our republic. And living under the rule of law means there are certain lines that cannot be crossed. As much as a guarantee of safety might be attractive, we're not willing to pursue it if it involves abridging certain rights. In fact, under the Fourth Amendment, we are prohibited from pursuing it through a wholesale sacrifice of liberty and privacy and dignity. Police can't search houses on a hunch. As I know from my law enforcement days, there is a procedure to obtain warrants before there's a search, as maybe the CIA might have done through the FBI before it searched the committee files, if indeed it did so. And government agents can't simply listen to our conversations on the phone because they believe there may be something threatening. Arbitrary, unconstrained governmental invasion of privacy was a reason that the gentlemen literally down the street got together to rebel and to write the Declaration of Independence. And part of the reason was secret courts operating in secret, like the Star Chamber, which was an anathema to them. And I submit, respectfully, should be an anathema to us today. The FISA court is such a court, making secret law through secret opinions, in secret proceedings, in many respects, having an impact on our lives that is unknown to most Americans, but has huge consequences for the future of our nation. And part of my frustration, I will tell you right up front, is the lack of attention to these issues on the part of the American public. They seem so abstruse, technical, difficult to comprehend, and yet they are so consequential for our nation. Our current system with that secret court is the result of a committee commonly known as the Church Committee, named after Senator Church, which was formed in 1975 with hearings that revealed how the CIA secretly opened Americans' mail, engaged in campaigns of surveillance and harassment designed to discredit Vietnam War opponents and journalists, and even bug Martin Luther King's hotel room, among other activities. And in response to these findings, Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which we know as FISA in 1978. FISA allows for domestic electronic surveillance when the government can show probable cause for an individual, that an individual or organization is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. And those are quotes from the statute. FISA also created a two-tiered court system composed of what we know as the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and an appellate court, the FISA Court of Review. These courts are where the government has to make its argument for surveillance or for collection of information. And the question really now is, how should the FISA court be reformed, if you agree that it should be, in a way that makes it more robust, more capable of protecting individual rights and liberties? And of course, this task is challenging because the nature of surveillance and communication has changed dramatically just in the last two or three decades. You know, again, going to the founders of our democracy who met in this very town, not far from here, the idea of the telephone would have been unimaginable, but the internet was unimaginable to us just a short time ago. And the dramatic explosion of means of in information and communication would have been certainly unimaginable to the original writers of the FISA Act in 1975. So there is a task of reform, and I believe we have to address it. Again, the Act will expire, certain key elements will end in June of next year, and we have an opportunity and an obligation to address these issues. 
All of you know that the FISA court hears arguments from only one side. Operates in secret, hears arguments from only one side, namely the government. So the central change I've proposed is that there be a truly adversarial process. As a litigator, but really as a lawyer, anyone here who has been through the legal training, and you don't even need that training to understand, just the kitchen table is a good forum to comprehend it. The airing of debate happens best when different sides are presented. And judges generally agree. Patricia Wald, whom I questioned when she was a witness before the Judiciary Committee, said that she benefited as a judge by hearing both sides and often missed an argument if it wasn't presented. A judge's nightmare is a defendant representing himself. And judges will insist on appointing a counsel for a defendant if he or she is unrepresented. As a prosecutor, as a U.S. attorney, I dreaded defendants representing themselves because the issues could not be aired and debated and considered sufficiently without an advocate for that individual. And of course, the Supreme Court agreed in Gideon v. Wainwright, where it, in effect, disagreed with Judge McCarry, the trial judge in Mr. Gideon's case, who said that he had given every opportunity to Mr. Gideon to represent himself, to air his arguments, and he had tried to be sympathetic to those arguments. The court said he needs a lawyer, and he got a lawyer, and the result was different with the lawyer than it was the first time around. So there is a, a lot of practical experience that confirms this idea that the adversarial process works better when it hears from both sides, and judge, judges reach better decisions when they hear both sides. Last summer, in one of his first comments on the metadata collection revealed by the Stone Tapes, President Obama said he believed that the FISA court would benefit from the addition of a civil liberties advocate. He was somewhat vague at the time, but I took it as confirmation that he agreed that there should be a special advocate or an adversarial process more robust than what we have now. But the form of advocate he's endorsed, I think, can be improved. And I thank him for his very thoughtful attention to this issue. But I think that the advocate can be made more effective if we, in effect, give it a certain form. As I see it, the special advocate must, for example, be able to proactively request participation in FISA court proceedings and to engage the FISA court of review appellate process for significant legal decisions. That would be a real reform, not just a cosmetic tweak to the current process. Giving this power to the advocate herself, rather than leaving it entirely in the hands of the court to invite an advocate on occasion when the court thinks it's important, is very, very important. We've heard from the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board that at least some of the judges on the FISA court believe they already have the power to call upon third parties for alternative views, but they have never exercised that power. So giving them the option or the choice is ineffective in my view. The structure requires the advocate to make decisions about when the opposing view should be presented. And that's also why I believe that the advocate should be a permanent position with an established office and a staff, not an occasional on-call observer status that the court hears only when it chooses to do so. And so my proposal would grant the advocate many of the powers of any counsel, assert factual and legal arguments, present them to the court, and take cases through the appellate process, much as appointed 
defender, public defenders do now. They are available whether or not the judge thinks a defendant needs a lawyer when the defendant needs a lawyer. And this special advocate, some may call him a constitutional advocate, would have the responsibility to protect our rights and liberties whether or not the court thought it was necessary in that case. Because courts may not appreciate the importance of issues when they arise, as Patricia Wald, a very distinguished jurist, said. My proposal would bar the advocate from delaying or undercutting the FISA process. Very importantly, it requires the advocate and her staff to obtain appropriate security clearances and maintain confidentiality, just as any other member of the FISA bar would have to do. And it allows the FISA court to grant a warrant without necessarily the participation of that advocate before the proceeding. The challenge could be brought after the warrant's granted, after the surveillance is initiated, if there is an exigent circumstance that justifies the warrant being granted, much as now happened in everyday life of the criminal law across America where the U.S. Attorney does what I did uh, for years and others, countless others have done, go to a judge, sometimes in the middle of the night, and have the legitimacy of the warrant tested afterward. But here, of course, there's no way of many of the targets of the warrants testing its legitimacy because they don't even know it's happening. And they won't know it's happening without there being a case in court resulting from a prosecution or some other proceeding. So uh, the idea is that adversarial argument improves the process, protects our rights, and accountability results from it as well. Accountability also requires greater transparency. So another aspect of my special advocate proposal would require the FISA court to disclose and release decisions that constitute a significant construction or interpretation of law, a significant construction or interpretation of law, like the metadata warrant, which was never disclosed until the tapes indicated that this information was being collected. Secret law made secretly, affecting our constitutional rights, again, we should not tolerate unless there is a greater showing that somehow our national security requires it and then for the period of time that is necessary. The releases of this information, of the opinions and rulings of the court, could be redacted or summarized to protect classified details, but release of them and the adversarial process would accomplish a key goal. And if you agree on nothing else here today, I think we can reach a consensus that confidence and trust has been eroded and needs to be restored. Obviously, the Snowden tapes have played a significant role, but the American public needs the assurance that the rule of law, the rule of law, will be more than a phrase when it comes to intelligence gathering. Public trust also comes from appearance and perception, not just the reality, of a balanced and unbiased court making these decisions. Unlike other courts, the judges of the FISA court are all appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court without any oversight or confirmation. They're all Article III judges, so they've all been confirmed by the Senate, as well as appointed by the President, but not for this role. And again, uh, without any disrespect, without a scintilla of disrespect for the Supreme Court or the Chief Justice of the United States, Americans may hesitate to trust a court whose members are picked entirely by one man without any kind of review, none, no review 
whatsoever. A court picked by one man will inevitably be more homogeneous, less diverse ideologically, as well as in background, than one assembled by multiple sources. And extensive research has, in fact, shown that judicial decision making is negatively affected by homogeneity. And that's why we have different kinds of people, different ethnic and religious and economic backgrounds serving on our court. And the move toward greater diversity is one that I have supported passionately and aggressively. And fortunately, this president has done as well. And that applies to ideological perspective as well. Adversarial process and protection of liberties is best guaranteed by that diversity of viewpoint. That's why my proposal to reform the court focuses on its composition. The FISA Judge Selection Reform Act authorizes the chief judge of each judicial district to appoint a member of the FISA court subject to review and approval by the Chief Justice. It's really a pretty modest change when you come right down to it. After all, the rhetoric is stripped away. It is a very modest change because we want to preserve the confidentiality of the court and we want to, in my view, stick to judges who've already been confirmed. The alternative of having them reconfirmed, I think, raises the danger of politicizing the process and I'm very sensitive to that concern. This reform, though, would ensure that the judges on the FISA court represent the broad mainstream of judicial opinion. And it's designed to give greater diversity on the FISA courts without undermining their independence from political pressures from Congress or the President or anyone else. Let me close uh, by saying uh, something that I think goes without saying. I have the deepest respect for our intelligence community. They are dedicated, patriotic, able Americans who serve, sometimes in harm's way, with great courage. And they perform a vital mission for our country. I have two sons who've been in the military, one in the Marine Corps Reserve serving in Afghanistan. He's back now, and he's in law school another son who is a Navy officer in training out on the West Coast. I'm a member of the Armed Services Committee as well as the Veterans Affairs C Committee. I know well and appreciate deeply the threats this country faces and the courage of men and women in uniform and out of uniform who serve in our diplomatic service as well as our military and the ways they benefit from the intelligence that is gathered by the agencies that too often we take for granted and too often we criticize unfairly. I am sympathetic to the challenges they face. And I want to make this system worthy of them. I want to make it the best it can be just as we expect them to be the best they can be. Our intelligence community and our legal framework must be not only worthy of them, but worthy of this place and of the Constitution that it symbolizes. And the rights of privacy, speech, assembly that here today we exemplify. And I believe that it is possible and necessary to achieve those ends. I believe it because of my years in the courtroom, not only as a prosecutor, but as a defense attorney, and my days in the legislature, because our values and ideals don't disappear simply because of enemies like Al Qaeda. In fact, really, when you think about it, the threat of Al Qaeda makes those values and ideals all the more important. It is what those brave men and women seek to uphold when they put themselves in harm's way. They're the reason that we're here today. And by 
undercutting or undermining them, we make the system unworthy of them. Those are high ideals, uh, and I know there's hard work to do to match the system with those ideals. And your work today, your dedication to those ideals, bringing us together today are very much appreciated, and I'm personally grateful for this opportunity to be here. Thank you. And I'm happy to take a couple of questions. You have a, a really smart panel ahead, uh, so I'm not going to take too long. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, two questions, first off. First off, where is the Pfizer Square? It is in Washington, D.C. If you're referring Thank you. physically where it is, it's in Washington, D.C. The judges come to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, the second uh, question is, most Americans can tell you who's on Dancing with the Stars or who won The Voice or who's on Walking Dead or anything like that, but they can't tell you anything about the FISA court. Uh, do you view the mainstream media as more of a distraction to keeping, uh, how should I say, the public dumbed down? They're, they're not interested in the FISA court. They're interested in who's, what's going to be on TV or who has been eliminated from this game show or something like that. All of us really bear a share of responsibility for the lack of public attention to Im important details like that one. Who's on the court? Where do they come from? There have been some good journalism. There have been good reporting on the FISA court that indicated the homogeneity of the backgrounds of the individuals. It's a matter of public record. So I don't blame anyone in particular. I think it is a failing that all of us have to address. And one way to do it is through this kind of forum. And I think that's why it's so important. I totally agree with you on adversarial procedures are critical. But in security issues, isn't time very critical? And would the introduction of an advocate slow the process? Another good question. And I may not have been clear about it. But again, no delay should result from this adversarial process. The challenge to a particular warrant could and probably would be done in a lot of instances after the warrant is granted. Remember, right now, as a prosecutor, I go to a judge in his office or I go to a grand jury behind closed doors. They grant me the power to search or surveil, whether it is a physical break-in, for lack of a better term, a physical entry more accurate, or some kind of surveillance. And then that act by the government is tested later. The same principle would apply here. It could be completely in secret, but the advocate, the constitutional advocate or special advocate, could and would challenge a ruling by the FISA court, either before the court, after it made its decision, or possibly on review. And then the issue of, for example, is the broad collection of telephone numbers, all telephone numbers of every American authorized by the statute, is there sufficient need for it that it would be justified under the statute? All of those legal contentions could be tested and argued through the adversarial process. But in the meantime, if there was a need for the government to be surveilling an individual planning some terrorist act, that surveillance could go forward. So your question is well taken. It is a point that has to be addressed. And if that's not the way to do it, some other way ought to be devised. I have no pride of authorship over any of these specific. If somebody has a better way to do it, I welcome it. I simply think that there, there ought to be a, an institutional place for the advocate to be on a full-time basis with the power to raise issues at some point that guarantees our rights as well as our security. Uh, thank you for being here, Senator. Um, you mentioned uh, Snowden, f for whom uh, some people see as a villain, some people see as a hero. What do you think of allowing a court or the FISA court 
to be open to third parties who have a desire to disclose what they believe is illegal government activity and having the court rule on whether or not that disclosure would be protected. Uh, and if it were, then the person would not be subject to criminal penalties. I think that's a separate sort of se set of issues that may need to be addressed. I'd want to see exactly how the system would operate. If there are complaints about law breaking, in effect whistleblowing, and they could be brought to the FISA court through an advocate, a special advocate or a constitutional advocate, that might be a means to do so. But the main purpose of this advocate really is to forestall violations of rights that later would be the subject of complaints by a whistleblower. In other words, much better to prevent any questionable legal activity before it occurs than have it be the reason that a whistleblower comes forward. But whistleblowing is a deeply established and uh, rightly esteemed tradition in our government. Uh, as Attorney General, I came to know firsthand the importance of whistleblowers in protecting our rights, and we need to guarantee that they are not subject to either retaliation or some other kind of bad action as a result of their blowing the whistle. I'm referring to whistleblowing in general, not to Snowden. And nothing I say here should be intended to, should be interpreted as condoning or approving what he did. Yes, sir. Well, Justice Jackson said that the Constitution's not a suicide pact. One of the things within the Constitution, however, is to let the sun shine in as a means of cleansing. Uh, would you consider putting a requirement in that over time that uh, the cases before the FISA court would be reported? I think reporting of cases, disclosure of rulings should be done when possible and when the rulings merit it regardless of time and be done in a way that preserves security. Redacting classified information may be uh, in effect summarizing the rulings of the court so that they could be raised in other kinds of challenges. You can't know whether rights have been impinged in the world of electronic communication without the court, in effect, giving some indication that it's been done. You know, the, the Fourth Amendment was framed at a time when generally there were actually physical witnesses to the English soldiers breaking down a door and rummaging through a person's house or taking someone into custody or some other violation of what the colonialists, the founders, thought was their basic rights as Englishmen. You know, it wasn't that they thought these rights were novel or original. They're the rights of people who live in a free country, which they thought they did as citizens of the colonies of, of England. And so they were just saying, we want to protect the rights we think we have right now. Well, those rights are no longer protected or impinged by physical action. You know, you think of the electronic world and all that can be done invisibly and secretly, and it is really mind-boggling. And so we need to match that challenge with a court that issues opinions when it can do so consistent with our security. You wouldn't want the, the court saying, we just authorized uh, a surveillance on so-and-so who we think is about to blow up a building or take over a plane or whatever. I mean, I'm really stating the obvious to all of you. And even though these principles seem obvious, they're much more difficult to enshrine in words. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank Senator Blumenthal again for a speech that was thoughtful, eloquent, nonpartisan, and in the best tradition of defending the United States Constitution. We're proud to have you at the National Constitution thank Center. You thank you so much. Great to be here. Thank you. Keep up the great work. I'll sit in the back of the room. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for doing it.
Let me invite the panelists uh, to join me up here at the uh, front of the room. And as they come up, I will introduce them because it's just such a superb group and you're going to be thrilled to hear the variety of their perspectives. We have coming first uh, Spike Bowman, who is the... You were supposed to sit next to me? Absolutely. Please sit right here. Uh, he is the uh, uh, retired senior counsel of national security law and the director of the intelligence issues group for the FBI. Next we have Judge James Robertson. He is a former judge on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. He is a member of the Constitution Project's Liberty and Security Committee. And we have Alexander Joel, who is the Civil Liberties Protection Officer for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And finally, we're thrilled to have Angela Canterbury, Director of Public Policy for the Project on Government Oversight. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Blumenthal has given us three concrete and extremely important proposals for reforming the FISA court. First, he said that we should, uh, the Congress should create a special advocate to create adversarial proceedings. Second, he argued for greater transparency of the court's uh, opinions and disclosure of their existence. And third, he called for a change in the way the members of the court are appointed and said that rather than the Chief Justice of the United States appointing all the members, uh, other judges or broader and more diverse appointment procedures should be implemented. I want to debate and discuss each of those proposals. I want to begin with Judge Robertson. Uh, Judge Robertson, you not long ago did something uh, that I can describe from a constitutional perspective as quite principled and even heroic. Namely, you resigned from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court because you thought it was not acting consistently with constitutional principles. And historically, there is a very small and distinguished group of judges who have resigned from uh, their uh, courts on grounds of constitutional principle. I, there are the judges during the pre-Civil War era who resigned because they didn't want to enforce fugitive slave laws. And I'm not comparing the uh, stakes precisely, but you're in that small company of judges who've resigned on principle. Tell us why precisely you resigned from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and what you think of Senator Blumenthal's proposals to reform it. Well, you've just given me leave to talk for the next hour. and Nobody <laughs> else will have a chance to talk. Well, we'd be happy to hear it. Uh, well, first of all, Jeff, thank you for, for, that, for all the nice things you said. Uh, you, you've asked me exactly why I resigned from the FISA court. It wasn't because the FISA court was acting improperly. It was because the FISA court wasn't acting at all. I didn't. I, I, I resigned while I was still an Article III judge, and, and I, I refused to say anything about why I resigned for a long time. And a lot of people thought that was coy. Well, it wasn't coy. It was because I was still a sitting judge, and I thought it was improper for me to go public with my criticisms. But now I'm retired, and I'm a civilian, and I can say whatever I want to say. Um, I resigned because the... Nick, the Bush administration and the NSA were conducting this, uh, this kind of predecessor of the 215 program without bringing it to the FISA court. They, they bypassed the FISA court. And it seemed to me that the FISA court was supposed to be acting on, on issues like this. And for them, to, uh, for them to hold up the FISA court as the protector of our liberties and freedom at the same time do an end run around the FISA court with this NSA program, it seemed to me, was to make the FISA court into something of a Potemkin village, just as a, a pretend operation. And I, I uh, uh, refused to go along with that, and I resigned. Now, I, I carefully did not try to solicit other judges to resign. I didn't think that was proper either, and, and, and so that's the that's the answer to your question of, of why I resigned. Now, <clears throat> what I think of the senator's proposal, I first of all, um, the, the nation ought to be very grateful for Senator Blumenthal and his leadership and his focus and his, and his interest in this subject. Um, somebody from the 
audience mentioned that the, the country doesn't know much about this and doesn't care much about this. It's important that the country know more about it and think more about it and talk more about it. So it's wonderful that, that, that we're having this discussion. I disagree with the senator on a couple of details of his, of, 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 of his proposal. And let me work backwards because the third proposal had to do with the way judges are, are, are selected. I frankly don't think there's anything wrong with the Chief Justice appointing them, but if it makes people feel better to have them appointed by the Chief Judges of the circuits with the approval of the Chief Justice of the United States, that's a, I agree with the Senator, that's a pretty minor change and, it would, and if it makes people feel better, that's fine. Um, there are 12 circuits, there are 11 circuit judges, um, we'd have to add one, but that's, that's not a, that's a detail. With respect to um, the Senator's proposal that there be more um, transparency to yeah. the rulings of the FISA court, I think everybody agrees with that general proposition. The problem is in the details because, because the, whole, the whole Snowden problem, of course, was, the, was that uh, Snowden revealed the capability the government has. And it's hard, to, it's hard to make the decisions of the FISA court transparent without very nuanced declassification uh, protocols, which, by the way, under our system, it is the executive branch of government which controls classification. Congress doesn't do it. The courts don't do it. The executive branch does. That's the way, that's, the, that has been set in stone for a long time. So the executive branch would have to figure out what's classified and what's not classified. And I'm in principle, I'm in favor of it, and we ought to have some words in there asking the court to be more transparent. And indeed, in recent months, um, in the last year, the court seems to have been doing that, so it's getting more transparent. The, ma the main point on which I disagree with the senator has to do with the, with the establishment of, a, of a, an office called the Office of Public Advocate. Um, I don't think we need another office or another bureau or another uh, permanent appointee of any kind. Most of the work of the FISA court has to do with individual warrants, just like ordinary everyday search warrants that are issued in the courts all over the country. I don't know what the percentage is, but I would bet that it's north of 90 percent of the work that the FISA court does today. When I was on the FISA court, that's all we did. Uh, where we need the adversary is to, to look at and approve and study and argue with the court about what, what, what is generally referred to as the programmatic work of the FISA court. Now, we, we can get into the weeds on what the FISA court does here, but then I really would be taking an hour, and I think it's already time for me to shut up. Uh, but the, suffice it to say that there are a few areas in which the FISA is now doing work <coughs> that, that I believe there ought to be an adversary in there, but I'd be happy with a panel of attorneys selected by the public, uh, by the uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which insists on calling itself PCLOB, <laughs> which I call PCLOB. Um, and if, if they would set up a panel, then the FISA court could reach out to them when they wanted to. Uh, and I would make one, one more proposal that the senator didn't make. Um, there is a provision in the FISA law for the court to sit and bank, that is, all 11 judges together. But it's very limited in when, when they can do it, and to my knowledge, they never have done it. I would, prov I would require that the FISA court sit in panels of three judges whenever they are dealing with, um, whenever they are dealing with programmatic issues or new legal issues that, that have to be sorted out. I think uh, a lot of the, uh, it, it has been said that the FISA court is a rubber stamp. Some people say it's not a rubber stamp, it's an echo chamber. But the fact is that the 215 program that everybody's worried about has been sequentially approved by every single FISA court judge who's looked at it 
over the last many, many, many years. Um, um, if you had three judges approving that, there would be some chance of the judges to start arguing with each other. And once judges start arguing with each other, they'll invite lawyers in uh, to, uh, to, to make a more nuanced and complete argument of the subject. I think I should stop talking there because I'm, I'm hogging the time here. Not at all. That was superb. And what you've very helpfully done is we're going to dig into the details of the senator's proposals and debate them on this panel, which is mixed in terms of background and perspective. Spike Bowman, you have uh, great practical experience as Deputy General Counsel of the FBI. Uh, I want your thoughts on the senator's proposals to create a special advocate, and in particular, do you think judges are equipped to deal with changing technologies and help the law evolve, and would a special advocate help them make those sort of decisions? Well, I have sent literally thousands of FISA warrants to the court, and I've, it has been my experience that none of the judges and certainly not the Department of Justice, ever rubber stamped anything we sent from the FBI. It was often like pulling teeth trying to get warrants over to the court because they had such oversight from the Justice Department. This proposal has been around for more than 20 years, and not, to ju not this particular one, but the idea of a, of a public advocate. I've never really opposed the idea. I think it is fraught with implementation problems. Um, but I also think, more importantly, that if we had started something like this 20 years ago, it would be totally useless today. My reason for that is that technology is, is rapidly changing everything that we do. It's changing our social nuances, how, what we think is private and what is not. And let me give you a, a short example. In, in 1928, there was a criminal case called Olmstead in which a police officer who was rum running at the time, was convicted primarily on co telephone conversations that he had. And he appealed to the Supreme Court saying that there should have been a warrant to get these. And the Supreme Court said, no, this is your conversation is not tangible. We can't hold it in our hands. We can't grab it. That's not within the Fourth Amendment. So you, you, Mr. Olmstead, you're going to jail. And that's the way things were for a long period of time. And through the years, We've been getting gradual changes of things. Just recently, there was a case before the Supreme Court in which a slap-on beeper to a car, a GPS transponder, was put on, and the person was convicted of a crime. It went to the Supreme Court, and a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court said, no, you needed a warrant to put that on. That overturned 60 years of practice. Now, what I'm getting at here is I'm concerned more for the, for the court's ability to understand what is going to happen to them with technology. We had a case that, uh, called Operation Shamrock that lasted for about 30 years uh, that, by which NSA was looking at foreign, uh, foreign issues. And it started out perfectly legally based. And because of advancing technology, the legal base changed. But through the decades, no one ever did anything different. They were always doing exactly the same thing they'd done before. The FBI was getting information for NSA. NSA analysts were, believe, were doing the analysis that they'd always done. Nobody changed their job, but the technology changed. And it changed the, the basis from which they were doing things. So they were actually doing something illegally without knowing it. Think about the 215 program. This is the metadata that NSA is collecting. Today, we're, they're collecting bulk data. When we established the 215 program, we never imagined we'd collect bulk data with it. We thought it would be something where we target one person. I'm going to get Jeff Rosen's typewriter or his computer or something like that. Uh, and what has happened now I think is because we have the ability to do something that we didn't have 10, year, 10 or 15 years ago. We didn't, by the way, put, we didn't have the ability to store this information 15 years ago. So, but today we have abilities that we've never done before. The 215 program has morphed into something that we were not thinking about when it was created. And my concern is that we're going to have this issue come up. In that Olmstead case, the dissent was Justice Brandeis 
who said two things. He said, one, this telephone thing, this is new. We don't know what technology is going to bring us tomorrow. And two, he said, the fundamental purpose of the Fourth Amendment is to keep the government out of your business, out of the individual's business. He says that the right of the individual to be left alone. So my concern here is that we have the ability somehow for the court to understand what the consequences are of the types of decisions that they may be making. And the, the court is made up of fairly senior Article III judges who are not technicians, who are not engineers. So the one place that I would disagree with the judge is that I'm not certain I want a whole bunch of lawyers debating this. I want somebody who understands the technology, and not only the technology, but where it may lead us. Wonderful. Well, you've invoked Justice Brandeis's dissent in Olmstead. Uh, my favorite uh, document, whenever we have a hard question here at the Constitution Center, I ask WWBD, what would Brandeis do? And you said he would have insisted on technological sophistication. <coughs> Angela, Canterbury. The question on the table is, would a special advocate actually solve the problem? So Spike Bowman just said, we never intended the authors of the Patriot Act to authorize bulk data collection. And Representative Sensenbrenner has said the same thing. Would a special advocate solve that problem? Or as long as the bulk data collection continues, would having a special advocate sort of appear before the court to recertify it not do anything really to reform the Fourth Amendment questions that people are concerned about? So alone, it doesn't solve the problem. This is a huge, complex set of issues. And certainly, there's not one single reform that's going to change um, the court or the way we protect our rights in the face of this um, growing use of technology and unlimited means of communication. Um, I completely agree that that environment is um, ever-changing and requires more technical expertise. I do think that the special advocate would bring on board with it, especially as envisioned by Senator Blumenthal, several other measures that are needed. Transparency. How, how do you bring in expertise to the court? How do you have someone overseeing these decisions? And um, how do you allow for the technical expertise that is not on the court in? Well, I believe that Senator Blumenthal's um, proposal would get us part of the way there, allowing for third parties to come in uh, as friends of the court and to participate uh, and allow the special advocate to indeed advocate for participation by third parties. Um, the way we, we can't know <laughs> what we don't know. <laughs> so we have to have more sunlight, and we need to have um, a mechanism for oversight. I've been concerned about some um, suggestion that having the court itself be an overseer is, is inappropriate. I, I think that. Certainly, we want uh, the judges to um, have full information. But there has to be congressional oversight. And there has to be public oversight over how the law is being interpreted. And so the bigger picture is this whole universe of secret law uh, in which we live, where it is um, clear that we are not meeting both the needs of keeping us safe and secure and protecting our constitutional rights. And so how do we lift the veil, um, not just through the FISA court, not just through a public advocate and having more disclosures to Congress and to the public, but in general, how do we challenge this overt secrecy that truly is threatening our way of life? Well said. Um, Alexander Joel, uh, you are the Civil Liberties Protection Officer of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. First of all, tell us about your position. I think this is relatively newly created. What are you actually doing and what insights from the privacy protections that you're overseeing could be brought to bear in constraining the FISA court? Thanks. Uh, and I, I really want to thank you for uh, hosting this forum and for inviting me here. I think it's a very important one. Uh, I'm the Civil Liberties Protection Officer for the Director of National Intelligence. I report directly to uh, Director Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence. I've held this position since the stand-up of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. This was created uh, following the 9-11 Commission report to help, the, the Office of Director of National Intelligence was, help, uh, was created to help better coordinate and lead all of the intelligence agencies in our federal government so that we 
could better connect the dots, coordinate our, our intelligence uh, activities. And my position was created reporting directly to the director so that we would have an office uh, looking out for people's privacy and civil liberties as we also looked out for people's national security. I, I'd like to quote um, one of my favorite documents, which is timely here, the, the Constitution, Good, which I've always it. carried with me. That's um, a Cato Constitution. I know. I was about to ask you what, if you guys really have the We have a whole bunch, bunch, and you're going to have to get one. All right. One I'm going to have to get one because sure. we hand these out on Constitution <laughs> Day. That's but in the, in, the, in the preamble, it says, yeah, you don't, you don't want me to advertise this one? Well, that's fine. Okay. They're good, right. too. It says, uh, provide for the common defense and secure the blessings of liberty. I mean, those are two things that it says in the preamble, of course. It says other things. So we're always trying to find ways to do both. And there are differences of opinion, of course, about how you, how you go about and do it. But I think the, 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 the activities being carried out under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act really do engage with all three branches of government that were established by the Constitution. So I really do think that's important. We have the, the judiciary in the form of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. We have Congress, which periodically reauthorizes these authorities, takes a look at them. We have re robust reporting and oversight, I agree, is very important by, by Congress, by the Intelligence Committees and the Judiciary Committees. And we also, um, of course, have layers of executive branch oversight. The Department of Justice as has been mentioned, is very much involved in these foreign intelligence surveillance activities. My office is involved, offices of general counsel, offices of inspector general, throughout the intelligence community. And we have, you've mentioned the P Club, the newly established Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which is an independent agency in the federal uh, executive branch that is also looking at these things very critically, very independently. Um, and we are working hard to support their oversight and their review of these activities. So we have what I call a system of uh, many layers with many players. And now we're trying to think about how do we uh, address the challenges that we're facing today, potentially by adding another layer and another player. And my, my own view is that you have to be careful with doing it. I mean, I think it's great to hear diverse viewpoints. Diversity is, is a value, certainly in the intelligence community. It's in our principles of professional ethics. Uh, we we uh, very much encourage diversity of thinking as well as all forms of diversity in the intelligence community. We understand how important that is to analysis. We, we very much value um, alternative approaches. And of course, in the legal tradition, we've heard, and I won't, I won't repeat what you've already heard about the value of hearing um, opposing viewpoints uh, skillfully and fully argued. So those are all important. We think that would be enriching uh, to any analytic process, including what, what a judge goes through. But there are there are some practical considerations that I think you'd have to think about. I mean, one of them, people, we've heard a lot here about um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court being a secret court. Um, from the intelligence community's perspective, I think, and I'd like the people in this room to understand, that is an enormous uh, value of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. If they weren't conducting their operations in secret, if you could see everything they did in C-SPAN, then they wouldn't have access to the good stuff. You know they're having access to the good stuff because they have secure compartmented in, in, information facilities. They have people with clearances reviewing it. They have, the, they have all the, the wherewithal to see the nation's most important secrets, and they're doing it in a way that can be trusted by the nation's leaders. So they are looking at very sensitive intelligence secrets, sources and methods, in order to pass on the legality from the judiciary's point of view. That is extremely important. Can we be more transparent? about how they conduct that activity? Um, I think the answer has been yes. We're certainly trying to be. Um, uh, as, as you've heard say, it's difficult to do it. The, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has established a website, which is, I believe, new for them. They're trying to post their opinions there. We are working very hard with them to try to uh, find opinions to redact, find ways to redact the opinions and post them. Uh, the intelligence community has established a blog uh, on Tumblr, which uh, I had to learn about recently. Um, it's called IC on the Record. So you can go to just, just Google IC on the Record, and you will find redacted Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court opinions and pleadings, and, uh, and we're working hard to tr put additional matters up there. I can't say that they're self-explanatory. You read them. They're written in kind of dense legalese. There's, there's blocks of redacted text. There's a lot of stuff that's technical. So another issue... Um, that, that, uh, that, that we have to think about is not only the need for, for a person to have clearance and the ability to review things in a, in a manner that preserves uh, the, source, uh, the secrecy of sources and methods, but also familiarity with how the intelligence community operates. Um, 
uh, it takes sometimes years of, of work to really understand why it is certain things are done a certain way, how what we do compares, for example, with the, with the activities of other countries, how what we do ha has uh, developed historically over time, how does it compare with law enforcement, um, why is it different from law enforcement. Um, and all of those kinds of issues takes a lot of focused attention and time to, to really understand. So those are, those are just a couple of different practical considerations that I think we're going to have to think about. Okay. Uh, Judge Robertson, uh, Judge Bates, the head of the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, wrote a letter to, to Chairman Feinstein recently opposing the creation of a privacy advocate. He said, the participation of a privacy advocate is unnecessary and could prove counterproductive in the vast majority of FISA matters. Uh, it would neither create a truly adversarial process nor constructively assist the court in assessing the facts, and the advocate would be unable to communicate with the target or conduct an, an independent investigation. First, was it appropriate for Judge Bates to express these opinions on this pending matter that Congress is considering, and do you agree with his criticisms? I am a friend of John Bates. He is a great judge. He is... Um, he was the presiding judge of the FISA court. He is now the director of the administrative office of the U.S. courts. In addition to being an Article III judge, he's quite a guy. And was it appropriate for him to do this? Absolutely. I mean, he's, he was the, um, uh, he, in his capacity, either as director of the administrative office, um, uh, he has, frankly, a direct pipeline to the chief justice. The chief justice wanted him to do it. Uh, he, he knows as much about FISA as anybody, perfectly fine. Um, do I agree with him? I agree with, actually I agree with a great deal of what he said in, 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 in that letter. The one thing, the one place I do not agree with him about, or I, I really decline to engage in this discussion, is his, is his idea that it would be counterproductive to bring in um, a special advocate because as he, as he argues, because then the government might not be as candid with the, with the court as they now are. Well, I, I, I think that's a kind of an inadmissible argument. I mean, um, if, if, if the suggestion is that, the, that uh, if you brought in an, an, an outside person into this, into this warm little discussion group of the government and judges who all trust each other, all of a sudden the government backs away and doesn't, doesn't tell everybody everything. Um, that's not the way I want the government to act. And that's not the way it should act. And uh, there's, I, I just don't agree with it. I, I, don't think, I don't think there's any evidence for the proposition that the government would back off and withhold information either from the court or from the special advocate. So that part of what he said, I, 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 di I disagree with. He, he also is concerned about the timing question, about slowing down the processes of the FISA court. And I think Senator Blumenthal answered that completely and, and to my satisfaction. Um, you can, there, there's no reason to stop the intelligence process. We're talking about, about uh, appealing it. Uh, uh, I mean, surveillance all by itself doesn't, doesn't kill anybody. Uh, search warrants are issued all the time that are that are later held not to have been appropriate. So, I'm I'm not worried about the timing issue, and I don't agree with him about counterproductive. But other than that, John Bates has most of it right. I think that's great. Well, thank you for the good words on behalf of Judge Bates, who is indeed a distinguished and principled judge. I am going to ask a follow-up question because I think it'll broaden it for the group. As I hear your reasons for resigning from the FISA court, the main objection was that the metadata collection program was not being brought to the attention of the court in the first place. Since you left the court, it has been reviewed by the court. The FISA court upheld its constitutionality, but now the federal district courts have divided on the question. Judge Leon in Washington has denounced the program as a probable violation of the Fourth Amendment. It says James Madison would have been aghast at this slow and gradual incursion on liberty. Uh, Judge Palfi in, in New York has reached the opposite conclusion and said it is consistent with the Fourth Amendment because we have no expectation of privacy and metadata we surrender to third parties. Justice Scalia says he thinks the Supreme Court will hear this case. 
let's assume, we don't know what the court's going to do, and if you'd like to tell us what you think the constitutional answer is, I'd be delighted to hear it. If you don't feel like opining on that issue, imagine the court did strike down the metadata collection program. Would, what additional reforms do you think would be necessary to make the FISA court consistent with the Fourth <coughs> Amendment? Well, I, that, that <coughs> you're, you're raising a really big question because, because there, there are a lot of people who think that the FISA court, that we shouldn't have a FISA court at all. <coughs> that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that the, the whole process uh, of evaluating what the government is doing in the intelligence field can be done perfectly adequately by existing district and federal and, and, and appellate courts. There are confidentiality provisions. There are ways of dealing with confidential issues, and, and we shouldn't have a secret court to do this. It is a star chamber and so forth. Uh, I don't feel that way, but I, do, but I do think that there is a question of what kind of a court the FISA court really is. Is the court an Article III court because the judges on it are Article III judges? I don't think so. I think it's a special, it's a special court with special jurisdiction, and uh, um, I'm, I sort of lost track of your so of, 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 yeah. of your question. But I but I think um, what else has to be done if, if the, there's no metadata program? What 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 other reforms are necessary for the FISA court? Because because if there's no metadata program, there will be another program down the road. I mean the. The president and the and the executive branch of the government have constitutional powers to do intelligence work that, that doesn't require judicial oversight all the time. Um, there, there will the as Mr. Bowman suggests earlier, this is a constantly evolving thing, and con government is not going to stop trying to find th find out what's going on just, just because the 215 program is knocked down. They will try something else. There will be other attempts to gain intelligence. Uh, so the FISA court needs to be there to review and approve what's, what's going on uh, in the next evolution after 215. Does that answer your question? I'm going to try one more time just because you're the, you know, you're the James Madison of the FISA court, so we've <laughs> got to take, take advantage of this chance to yeah, have you right. here. The, there's going to be future efforts. The FISA court is still there. What uh, are you happy with the FISA court as it's currently constituted uh, structurally, or are there additional reforms that you believe are necessary to make it consistent with the Constitution? I continue to believe that there should be an, ad an, a, an adversary opening into the FISA court. We can argue about the details of it, um, but I think uh, I, I am. I spoke out in favor of an adversary process at the beginning of the PCLOB uh, process. I, I absolutely think there has to be uh, a way for third parties, amicus curiae, some, some other party to get in and make arguments. You know, the, the public, uh, the, the, the PCLOB issued a very, very long report on, the, on, on, on 215 and found it to be not unconstitutional but illegal under the under the uh, uh, provisions of the of 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 section 215 said section 215 itself does not authorize the the metadata program that argument to my knowledge was never made to the FISA court and would not have been made to the FISA court but for an adversary and if if an adversary had been there and presented that argument to the FISA court the FISA court might have said wait a minute maybe maybe they're right about that maybe Maybe uh, maybe it is illegal, not on constitutional grounds, but on the grounds that it's it's not permitted by by the legislation, the words of Section 215. Remarkable. Okay, that's a very strong example. Why don't we, uh, the, the rest of the panelists, dig in in response to Judge Robertson's challenge. Uh, Spike Bowman, you, you didn't say an advocate was um, absolutely uh, unnecessary. You had some concern about evolving technologies. If you were devising an advocate, what do you think an effective uh, structure would look like? Well, I think I would take some of what judge, the judges said here uh, about having a, a panel, as he put it, of lawyers that would be available for this sort of thing. 
Only I would not leave it at that point. I am very concerned that the, the FISA court, like the rest of us, is going to get left in the dirt as technology changes things. So that whatever panel you have has got to have the ability to pull in the, the, the experts of whatever the issue is. You know, it's not a one-size-fits-all. The, the different engineers, different types of, of expertise, uh, cyber issues are going to be need, are needed to come to the, the court because technology is just not going to stop. Yeah, and we're already seeing the idea form around the country, including at the Supreme Court, that surveillance is just getting too easy right now. And it's only, only because of technology. And I think the 215 program is the poster child in this generation of, what's, of what is needed. I've got to throw in one thing. The concerns of privacy are probably more for you out there than it is for your grandchildren because they post their whole lives on Facebook. <laughs> You know, so there's there's going to be a split in the country, but what we have seen right now is a is a changing view of what is socially appropriate. The 215 program is collecting information that is not constitutionally protected. You have no right in, in that information, but the idea that's, that they're that's being debated not by by the federal district courts at the moment. No, they're they're debating the program, not the not the content. The two, the information that is there is, is constitutionally unprotected by, by virtue of Smith versus Maryland. I Judge think Judge Leon disagreed on that point and said we do have an expectation of privacy and metadata that's aggregated and can reveal a lot about us. It, yes, agreed. Individually that information is, is not protected. That I think is, is something that's going to change because the social appetite of the country seems to be changing based on this program. I want our two other panelists to we let Senator Blumenthal and his staff are here. If you have amendments to propose to his advocate <laughs> proposal, now we better seize our opportunity. So, Angela, how would you refine the proposal? I think I'll talk to them when I'm back in Washington. Okay, um, that's fine. Because we have all of these people here yeah. to speak with, and I think that there were some really important issues that were raised here. Um, I, I think it's terrific that you are using Tumblr and that you are trying to get more uh, information out to the public. I will note that the majority of documents that have been posted there were already leaked or were forced to have been disclosed through lawsuits through partner organizations of ours such as the ACLU and EPIC. And so I think that we have yet to see true proactive disclosure of things being de declassified and posted there uh, by the intelligence community. I think it, it's good for PR though. I think also, uh, you know, we have to talk about this closed circuit, this monopoly on information. So it's not just the court. Yes, I agree, an adversarial uh, proceeding is m it's much needed in that court. Yes, we need more experts, to, whether it's through um, amici or through um, being able to call special witnesses, but making it operate more like a normal court. <laughs> I'm all for that. But how do we remove this closed circuit? Because right now in the FISA court, it's just the government and a judge. How do we bring more um, experts in, and more oversight? How, how do we bring the other branches into the courtroom? But also, how do we bring the legal decisions that are being made at the Department of Justice that buttress the decisions that are made at the FISA court out into the public, the uh, legal memos? that justify things such as extraordinary rendition, drone strikes, and the collection of uh, information about Americans' communications, those legal decisions are being made, those interpretations, rather, are being made by the Department of Justice and then being kept secret. So we've got Congress passing laws and then they're being interpreted in secret by the executive branch and then being approved in a secret court. So I ask you, how is that democratic? Where is our constitutional democracy? How can we hold our elected officials accountable for the laws that they're making on our behalf when they're being used in a way that is completely unknown to us? Alexander Joel, a good question from uh, your colleague. Why should the government be in charge of deciding which opinions are public and should some independent body decide what's posted and what's redacted? So there are 
there are different pro procedures that we've been looking at to try to increase transparency and address those kinds of concerns. I mean, we understand the need for transparency in a democracy. The, the, the countervailing consideration, of course, is, um, is that if you are completely transparent, then you have no intelligence service. And so you have to find a way to, to balance both because um, uh, protecting sources and methods is the term that we use in the intelligence community is essential if you're going to be effective in your job to protect the nation and our allies in, in carrying out these intelligence activities. So um, it is a very careful process. I'm not saying that it's happening quickly or overnight. Um, it, is, it is, I've said in other contexts, the intelligence community is um, built, resourced, designed, trained, and focused around secrecy. We, we try to obtain the secrets of our adversaries, and we try to keep secret how we're doing so in order to be effective in national security. That is what an intelligence service does in the United States, and that's what the intelligence of other countries do around the world. That is the nature of intelligence. That said, we are in a democracy, and so it is important for the reasons you've said, for the American people uh, to understand what we're doing. Um, in the past, what we've done, of course, is provided transparency to oversight entities, to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, to uh, congressional oversight committees. We've tried to learn the lessons that, that people have mentioned the senator mentioned uh, the, the church committee uh, hearings. And so we try to learn those lessons and try to uh, adjust. We're not perfect, and we've continued to try to learn additional lessons as we go forward. Um, I will just say that in terms of the, of, of the IC and the record, if I could just respond briefly on that, um, it's true that a lot of those documents were the subject of FOIA litigation. But how much you redact and what you disclose still depends on judgments that are made in terms of how transparent you can afford to be uh, while still protecting the underlying secrets. And even though documents may have been uh, disclosed without authorization, it is still a judgment call as to what you, are to, what you can and should continue to uh, disclose through official channels. And so those, those are difficult determinations. They're made uh, after a lot of care and deliberation. And um, so the documents that are posted on ICI on the record do reflect a very forward-leaning attitude that the President has directed the intelligence community to take on transparency and that we have embraced and are trying to take uh, to the best that, that we can. I mean, it's not, again, it's not perfect. It's going to take time for us to reor reorient ourselves to, to be uh, uh, more uh, aligned with transparency than we have in the past. So it's, I ask people to be patient. Uh, we are working that way. But I also ask people to understand that in order to be effective, we do have to find ways to continue to keep secrets. Well, we have a bunch of excellent questions from our extremely informed and thoughtful National, National Constitution Center audience, and we're going to jump right in because we have a few minutes. There have been several recent requests in the press to start a new series of church committee hearings. Do we need a new church committee, and if so, what should its jurisdiction be? What should it investigate? Judge Roberts. I, I do not think we need a new church committee. I think... Um, um, we have to remember that this whole, this whole thing began with Snowden <clears throat> because without Snowden we wouldn't be having this discussion. We, we, an, an enormous amount of, of, of uh, valuable public discussion has occurred since, since Snowden. I don't know what you think about Snowden. I've got my own views about Snowden. Uh, I don't think he's a hero, but I have to admit that uh, that uh, what he what he has done is useful. Uh, that is the detritus of what he did is is has been useful for the country. But a new church committee, I don't think there's any evidence for the proposition that we have a rogue CIA or a rogue FBI or 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 anything of the sort. I I was fond of telling people when I went to the FISA court in the first place that I went there to find out what our intelligence committee, uh, community was up to because I wasn't, wasn't, sure I, wasn't sure I believed them. Uh, what I found when I was there and what I'm sure is still the case is a extremely careful, fastidious, eye-dotting, T-crossing, uh, perfectly, uh, almost to a fault, careful, process of people who are trying to obey the law and doing the best they can to obey the law. I don't think that was the situation that gave rise to the church committee, and I don't think we need a new church committee today. We have a follow-up, uh, which I'll ask you, uh, Spike Billman, on a related matter. Is there a need for a drone court, and could the drone court and FISA court be combined? 
I don't think there's a need for a drone court, but I do think that uh, there should be published procedures to explain how this how this works. The, uh, the 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 reason for the there are two reasons that the there's been a call for some kind of uh, process here. One, the probably the most uh, the most telling has been the one where the where drones have been used to kill Americans overseas. The the simple fact is those Americans were were uh, enemy actors. And we've had this before. Americans, we've fought Americans before who have turned against us during periods of war. Uh, so it's, it's really no different there. The, the problem with the drone is that it is not a discrete weapon, uh, you, know, you know, unless you've got, as we've had a couple of times, a jeep traveling across the desert and there's one person in it or, you know, a couple people there. The problem with the, the drone is that the enemy tends to seek its, its cover in populated areas. And using the drone is very difficult. And I think, I think the Obama administration has probably been doing a very good job of making sure that they have appropriate procedures for it. I don't know that. I think it's probably true. But I think there should be, and I see no reason why there could not be, published procedures to explain to the public and to the rest of the world how we're going to use it. We do that with our rules, standard rules of engagement now. We tell the rest of the world, if we think you're going to fire on us, we're going to fire first. That's an important thing for people to know. I think that we should be doing the same thing with the drone pro probably program. I'm going to combine these two excellent questions. Uh, well, the first is, if the FISA court operates under a congressional authorization, why are there any questions about its constitutionality? And the second question is, to whom does an appeal of the FISA court decision go? The questions are related because one of the constitutional objections to the proposal for a special advocate as outlined by Marty Lederman and Steve Vladek, is that if the special advocate is an officer of the United States with the power to appeal FISA court decisions, it would be governed by the appointments clause of the Constitution and would have to be appointed according to those constitutional requirements. And I'm going to uh, give this question, uh, I think, to, 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 to you as, as the, because uh, you've thought carefully about this. Um, should the special advocate have the power to appeal FISA court decisions? Would that raise constitutional questions under the FISA, under the appointments clause? And more broadly, if Congress authorizes it, why are there constitutional objections to begin with? So I, I, I'm not a constitutional um, lawyer or scholar, but it seems to me that those are concerns that could be resolved pretty easily in legislation. So if it's a matter of making the special advocate Article Three, then that would just be stipulated in the legislation. I think, um, I think that uh, I'm not sure that it's been said that the FISA court itself is ultimately um, unconstitutional. Certainly, that hasn't been decided. But there is no review, and so one of Senator Blumenthal's um, reforms would be to provide for some mechanism for an appeal, <laughs> and this would allow the special advocate with eyes towards the constitutionality of the decisions being made there, of the threats to rights uh, of ordinary Americans, an ability to request an appeal, doesn't guarantee an appeal, but an ability to request an appeal from the review body, the FISA review court, and then the Supreme Court. And I think ultimately we need to, to ensure that the Supreme Court uh, while it's likely already within their purview, that it's, there is a more direct path um, to requesting on cert um, at the Supreme Court, a review of decisions that are being made in secret. An excellent response. And just on behalf of the Constitution Center, the broad answer to the question of how can a law that Congress authorized be unconstitutional, congressional laws are all subject to the Constitution. And it is possible for Congress to authorize something that would violate various constitutional provisions. The last question. I'm going to uh, give to you, Alexander Joel. What would replace FISA if it's not reauthorized? So, um, the, 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 the law itself, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, consists of different titles. So, the entire statute is not up for reauthorization. It's only um, certain parts of it. So, I think, I think the question probably goes toward the 215, uh, the Patriot Act reauthorization, which is the, the bulk collection metadata program. I believe that's probably what the question's about. 
Um, so people may recall that the president gave a very good speech on, I don't know, I won't characterize the speech for, from your perspective. I thought it was a very good speech from uh, on January 17th where he addressed uh, a lot of these issues about how to balance privacy and national security. And in that speech, he directed uh, a transition from the 215 metadata program he, uh, as it was currently uh, being carried out, as, as it was then currently being carried out. And he uh, directed some immediate changes. One of them was that each individual um, term being used, each individual telephone number being used to query the, the metadata uh, database would have to be individually approved by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And that has been carried out. That has, that has uh, that ha that is now in, uh, been approved by the court. That's a change that's been implemented. He also directed the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence to carry out a review and to uh, propose to him options uh, in very soon, before the end of this month, um, on on how to carry out this program with the data not being held by NSA in its current incarnation of the program. So that's that's underway uh, right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Senator Blumenthal started us off with a really uh, inspiring and thoughtful and nonpartisan speech about reform of this crucial issue. You've just heard an extraordinarily thoughtful and wide-ranging discussion. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Please come back next week. We have programs on uh, constitution making after the Arab, Arab Spring, the future of the First Amendment, as well as a return visit by Professor Dershowitz. Thank you on behalf of the National Constitution Center.